Hey everybody, welcome back to Linear Algebra. Welcome to the end of week two and the end of chapter two with me. We're going to talk about bases, dimensions, and rank nullity today. Notice we are not starting off with the big idea today. I have a question for you guys. How can we concretely describe the subspaces that we talked about creating last time? For instance, we had null space and column space very specifically. Um, null space, we were able to describe it using the span of some vectors when we like solved A. And then we used uh, column spaces span by definition, but like what about other spaces? So that brings us to the big idea. We want to describe all subspaces using span. That brings us to our first green box of new vocabulary for today. We've got a basis of a subspace V is a linearly independent set of vectors from V such that V is going to be equal to their span. I cannot stress that linearly independent part enough. If it's not linearly independent, it's just by default, not a basis anymore. Okay, let's look at some examples. So first one, we have the standard Standard basis vectors, if you remember E1, E2, and EN back in the day when I first introduced them, I said they're standard basis vectors. Now we know why. They are the basis of RN, so they are very appropriately named. Um, example 2, we've got 3, negative 1, and 2, 4 form a basis for R2, and we can go ahead and check that real quick. So let's check it. We're going to make it into a matrix. And I'm going to make it look the way I want it to look. I'm going to swap those real quick. And then I can do R3 plus 3R1, or R2, sorry, plus 3R1. That's negative 1, 4, 0, and then 14. So we have pivots here, and we have pivots in every row, and then that gives us AX equals B for all the B's in R2. Okay, so the span of those two vectors is going to give us all of R2 because we had um, pivots in every row, which gives us solutions for all the B's. So that one checks out. And then the last one, we have 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. It may span R2, because just using those first two, you can get all of R2. You did that on a worksheet, but it does not form a basis. They are not linearly independent. It's really easy to see. You just add those first two together, and you're going to get that third one. So not linearly independent means not a basis. Okay. So next. We talked about specific subspaces, null and column space. How do we find the basis for them? So null A, we were able to write the null space as in vector parametric form. And then the vectors that we found, um, this was the end of the last lecture. We did an example, very last example. The vector you found that's uh, that going to span the null space are always going to be linearly independent by construction. And so that's your basis right there, is whatever it is that you get to describe the span of the null space. Column space, it is the span by definition, but they are not necessarily linearly independent. If they are linearly independent, they are a basis. But if not, what do we do? Okay, so let's look at this example before we try and really answer that question. We have a matrix A. We can reduce it 
to this matrix B. I didn't feel like doing all the row reductions in front of you guys. So B has pivot columns. One, zero, zero, and zero, one, zero. So those are his pivot columns. Clearly they are linearly independent. Column number three, however, let's see. If we do two times that first one and subtract off that second one, we're gonna get column three. So he's clearly dependent on these other two. So we can say that call B is equal to the span of the three vectors, B1, B2, B3, but we don't really need B3 because B3 is in the span of B1 and B2. So he would already be there if we just take him out. Okay, so B3 is still in there because he's a combination of these guys. So call B is equal to the span of these two linearly independent vectors. So that means that these guys equal the basis for call B. Okay, so what about A now? I'm give myself some space. There you go. So row operations are not gonna affect the way columns relate to each other. So indeed to show that, I'm gonna do like, um, two, negative one, three. So I've taken the first column in A minus the second column. Just like I did over here. And that gave us the third column of B. And you'll notice, let's see, so that's gonna be a four and then a negative two minus three is negative five, six minus four is two. There you go, that is our third column of A. So that relationship is preserved through the row operations. Um, so then if we look at two, negative one, three, zero, three, four, these guys, are linearly independent. I mean, just look at the top one and be like, okay, the only way to get to zero is gonna be like to subtract it from itself, which is all zeros, or multiply by zero, that's all zeros too. You can't get the second one. Um, so we're linearly independent just like we were before in B. So these guys are the basis for the call space of A. Much more uh, compact and easy to think about than the thing that we did last time where we're like, the all points B that are on this plane. Well, if we had been able, if we had just looked at the uh, two vectors that were um, in the pivot columns, that would have given us the two vectors it took to span said plane from last time. Okay, so then that brings us to a very important theorem. The pivot columns of A form a basis for the column space of A. We saw that demonstrated in the last example and it turns out it works all the time. So we're gonna take this for a run Sample five, we want to find the basis for the null space and for the column space of A for this particular A. We're going to go after the null space first. 
because I think that's the easiest one because we've been doing that for a long time. You just take your matrix and you augment it by putting zeros on the right hand side and then you solve it. So let's go ahead and do that. You can even pause, do it yourself, and then hit fast forward and see if you did it right. <laughs> so I'm going to get rid of the 9 first. It's going to be row 2 plus 3 row 1. And then this 9 will also get, be getting gotten rid of <laughs> row 3 minus 3 row 1. Okay, so row one staying the same. Row two is changing. We've got zero, two, four, negative eight. And then row three becomes zero, negative four, negative eight, sixteen. And then row two will knock out row three. So row one stays the same. Row two stays the same. Row three is killed off. And then I'm going to divide row two by two. Two. Okay, and then now we have just this two that makes me unhappy right here. So let's get rid of him. It's going to be row one minus two, row two. So then three, zero, zero. And then one, two, negative four stay the same. But now this 2 is gone, and we're going to get some other stuff. We're going to get a negative 1, or not a negative 1, we get a negative 3, and a 15. How convenient! Now we can multiply row 1 by 1 third, and it's going to be pretty, just like we want it. Negative 1, 2, 0. Five, negative four, zero, 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 zero. Okay, beautiful. So then now we have systems of equations x1 equals neg or minus x3 plus 5x4 equals zero. x2 plus 2x3 minus 4x4 four four equals 0. x2, x4 are free, or x3, x4 are free. There you go. And then I'm going to go ahead and take that to the next page. Um, x1 is going to be x3 minus 5x4. X2 is going to be negative 2x3 plus 4x4. X2, X4, both free. Oh my goodness, again, X3, X4 are free, not X2. Okay, so that means we have the solution vector looks like X3 minus 5X4 negative 2x3 plus 4x4, x3, x4. Oh, I caught it right that time. <laughs> then we can write this in parametric vector form. That's going to be a 1, negative 2, 1, 0 for the x3s. Oh, yeah. And then a negative 5, 4, 0, 1 for x4. There we go. 
So what were we looking for? We're looking for the null space, or we're looking for the basis, but we know that null is equal to the span of these two vectors. Okay, so we know that these two vectors are linearly independent by construction, which we talked about earlier. So then this is the basis for the null space of A. And then now we do the column space, and that actually requires very little work at this point because all we need are the pivot columns. We've got pivot, we've got pivot, um, and returning to the original matrix, so we have the pivot columns where A1 and A2. So if we return to the original A matrix, so basis of the call space will be a1, which is 3, negative 9, 9, and A2, which is 2, negative 4, 2. There we go. So note, this gives us A basis. There are different possible bases, like really easily, um, since it's being defined by, um, they're going to give the span. All linear, all linear combinations. So um, if we take, uh, we'll do it with purple. If we take that guy right there. He's just a linear combination of this guy. So we could have used that vector instead of the 399 vector. Oh, <laughs> there we go. 133399. Three. Okay. So that's just an example of a basis. There are lots more, not even just scalar multiples. Lots of different vectors could be used to describe these um, spaces. Okay, so question, how many basis vectors does it take to create a subspace? Of course, that's going to depend on like the size of the space, but that gives us an interesting question to think about. So interesting, we have new definitions now. So we say that the dimension of a subspace V of Rn is the number of vectors in any basis of V. By convention, when we have the subspace of just V equals the zero vector, we say that the dimension of V is equal to zero. And then next definition that we have is the rank of a matrix, which is denoted rank A, is the dimension of the column space of A. All right, so since the column space is given by pivot columns, what we really have is that the rank of A is equal to the number of pivot columns in A, and then that brings us to, that is also the number of linearly independent columns of A. All those things are tied together. Okay, let's go ahead, do an example. This time I did the row reduction because one uh, row reduction was enough for me today. Um, Find the dimension of the call space and the null space if A, which is this matrix here, row reduces to this matrix here. Okay, so what we have is we're going to go after um, the dimension of the call space because back here it's a number of pivot columns and that's going to be really easy to pick out. So we've got pivot, pivot pivot. Okay, so B 
has three pivot columns, which means A has three pivot columns. Okay. Now we have the dimension of the call space of A, and that is three. So what about the null space? So null space, we need the linear, uh, we need the uh, span of basically the free variables. For instance, we've got x1 minus 2x3 plus 7x5, 2x2 plus 5x3 minus x5, and then x4 plus 4x5, x3, x5 are free. There we go. And then that's going to translate to x1 equals 2x3 minus 7x5, x2 equals 1 half, or 5 halves, I guess, x3 minus 1 half, x5, nope, mixed up my signs, I moved it to the other side, okay, x4 equals negative 4x5, x3, x5 are free, okay. So then the solution vector is equal to, mm -hmm, I'm going to split this up all in one step. It has been a long day. And here, I won't, I won't go that splitty. We'll do um, two negative five halves, one, zero, zero, and that's the x3 column. So x1 had that two, x2 had that negative five halves, and then um, x3 is just itself, because he's free. And then x5, we're gonna pick up all our x5 contributions. Um, x3 doesn't depend on x5, but x4 sure did. There we go. So then we've got the null space of A is going to be equal to the span of, I'm going to call this V1 and V2. So there we go. That means now we are ready to say that the dimension of the null space of A is equal to two. Notice though that two was the same as the number of free variables um, because that's where these V1, V2 vectors came from is by multiplying those vectors by the free variables. So we only have basic variables. Base ver basic variables come from pivots, and that gave us the dimension of the call space. And then we also have um, free variables, which gave us the dimension of the null space. You only have free and basic variables. So welcome to the rank theorem. The rank of A plus the dimension of the null space of A is equal to the total number of columns in A. And I can prove that real, real quick. So proof with quotes, the number of pivot points or pivot columns, mm -hmm. which would be our, um, which would be equal to the call space and the call space is equal to um, rank plus the number of non-pivots so 
it's going to be equal to the total number of columns. In A. So you've got pivot or you've got not got pivot and that's going to sum up all of your columns. The pivot columns give us rank which is equal to the column space and then non-pivot is going to give us the dimension of the null space because that was the free variables. Okay so basis theorem We've got let V be a subspace of Rn with dimension of V equal to P. First thing that we can say, if we have any collection P of linearly independent vectors, B1 through BP, then these form a basis of V. So again, proof by hand waving, just kind of like lightly justifying things. If you add another vector, so add another vector, we'll say BP plus one, to the set we already have, so now we've increased it by one. So if you put them in there, um, case one, he's going to be linearly dependent and remember you can't have a basis if your uh, vectors are linearly dependent. The other choice is he's linearly independent but then now you've got um, too many because the dimension of B, eh, not D, B of B1 up through BP plus 1 is going to be the number of linearly independent vectors, which is going to be P plus 1. This is now bigger than the dimension of V. So you've got too much in here now. So that means any, if it, your dimension is P and you have P linearly independent vectors, it is a basis for that space. And then number two, if we have any collection of P vectors where the span is equal to V, then these form a basis of V. And this, um, it's pretty similar. It's, I'm leaving it for you on a worksheet. I want to like say things, but I know I want to put it on the worksheet. And so I'm going <laughs> to resist from saying things right now. Okay, so notice though that we have things about column spaces and null spaces and dimension and those all go back to like the number of pivots A has. And the number of pivots that A has is very much addressed in the inverse matrix theorem, which means we can now add more things. Yay, we get to add more things to the inverse matrix theorem. Um, you can see, like, it might not be immediately obvious how these relate to the inverse matrix theorem, but don't worry, it's also on the worksheet. <laughs> um, but you can certainly see that, like, 0 or O implies P because the dimension of the call space is also going to be the rank of A. And then, like, that is going to imply that the null space is zero because if the rank of A, real quick, recall that A is a square n by n matrix. Um, so the dimension, or the rank of A, if it's n, takes up all the pivot columns. It means you have n pivot columns, so you don't have any free variables left for your null space, and so your dimension of the, your null space is gonna be zero. Okay. So you can kind of see how these guys link together, um, and I'll let you guys play with that a little bit in your worksheet. All right, bye for now.